like it. It makes it easy to remember. Because, you know, down here in the South, the way we pronounce things doesn't always match the spelling. <laughs> right. All right. And I'm going to start letting them in. And All right, y'all remember to mute and change the your screens, please. All right, so change the name on your screen and remember to mute. How did the progress meeting, progress report meetings go? Good? Thumbs up, awesome. Smiles, awesome. All right, there's your link for questions, awesome. Oh, good. There's Naja's clock. I don't know what time it is. <laughs> I've missed your clock. <laughs> I know I could turn that off, but... Now I'm sort of enjoying it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess I better turn it off. <laughs> I enjoyed the ding dong for a little while, but then I just got tired of it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Oops. Sorry. Okay. I think we're just about getting ready to go. We need a couple more people. So in the chat, you'll see the link for the questions. Okay. So we'll have our presentation and then um, he'll address your questions after his presentation. Okay. Oop, there she is. Okay. All right. So I is the um, introduction team ready to go. Right. Yes, I believe we're ready. You think you're ready. Okay. Let me get a couple more people in. Everybody's names. Make sure you fix your name on your screen because remember we're live on YouTube. So fix your name and stay muted. And we'll have um, our presentation by our guest speaker. And then the Google Doc is in the chat where you can put your questions. All right. And let me go ahead and pull up the... That up. Whoops, I should like go back to the there we go. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. I think we're ready to start. If our team, our introduction team will go ahead and let me know when you need me to. Move the PowerPoint. Okay, sounds great. Um, team seven, we're about to start. So hello everyone, we are team seven from CUB and it is a great honor that we are able to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Bram Borson um, today, who kindly elected to give a guest series lecture for us students at SSP. Uh, please next slide, Dr. Rice. Dr. Bram Borison is an astrophysicist and distinguished professor. 
he attended Oberlin College as an undergraduate and majored in math and physics. While there, he won an award for the highest score at Oberlin for the Putnam mathematics exam. He received his PhD in astrophysics from the University of Colorado at Boulder, his thesis examining X-ray binaries, star systems that contain neutron stars or black holes in orbit with normal stars. These star systems have been the main subject of Dr. Borson's astrophysics research and will be relevant in today's discussion. After Next. obtaining his PhD, no, still this slide. Um, after obtaining his PhD, Dr. Borson proceeded to conduct research at the Harvard Smithsonian Center of Astrophysics, MIT, and the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. He has also served on committees determining who uses the Hubble, Harvard Space Telescope and Chandra X-ray Telescope. He currently teaches at Clayton State University as an associate professor of physics in the Department of Physics and Chemistry. Um, next slide, please. So here are the names of some other uh, projects that Dr. Borson has worked on um, alongside, the Wolfram, <clears throat> alongside the Wolfram Summer School. Please feel free and uh, to give these research projects an individual read uh, after the guest lecture series today um, to learn more about the diverse methods in which science manifests in the world around us, and especially to learn more about uh, how science can manifest in an exciting career like astrophysics. Without further ado, please take it away, Dr. Borson. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for those uh, very warm and uh, detailed introductions about my, my background. Um, I'm not currently at Clayton State. I did have tenure there, um, but I left a couple of years ago and I've been teaching uh, to Albion College in Michigan remotely. Uh, so I've heard great things about uh, the summer science program. As I'll mention in this talk, uh, some of my colleagues are graduates of the summer science program. So I was told to sort of give a talk about uh, my overall career in astronomy and astrophysics, my education, my background, and some of the highlights of the things that I've, I've worked on with research and teaching. So I'm a researcher and an educator. I've taught a lot of astronomy classes and physics classes. Um, and being a teacher in addition to a researcher keeps you on your toes. It helps you give back to the community. Uh, at Clayton State, I was teaching three classes and two labs every semester. Uh, the topic of my, most of my research has been X-ray astronomy. So astronomers uh, can use any part of the electromagnetic spectrum. The visible light that we see is only a small fraction of the, the possibilities for photons. And in fact, in the past five or six years, we have a completely new type of astronomy now based not on photons, but on gravitational waves. So X-ray astronomy, um, it's a special niche is that it is the best way to study very hot gas in the universe. Uh, you might be familiar with the fact that uh, what we call thermal or black body radiation, uh, things that are hotter glow bluer. If you look at the flame on a gas burner uh, or even the flame on a match or a candle, the blue flame is hotter and the red flame is colder. So if you want to study the very hottest gas in the universe, uh, well, there's gamma rays, et cetera, but the, uh, some of the most, uh, some of the situations that give us a, a million degrees or 10 million degrees, uh, for that you really want to study uh, with X-ray telescopes. And X-ray telescopes have only been in operation since around the 1960s. And um, they've opened up a way to view neutron stars in black holes, for example, because the gas swirling around these extreme situations reaches extreme temperatures. Uh, so my personal strengths, I believe, since the start of my career is, are that uh, I, I tend to find very simple uh, symmetric mathematical patterns. And that's put me somewhat in the boundary between theoretical and observational work. Uh, most scientists work somewhere on this continuum between uh, observations and theory. And I work uh, pretty much in the middle. Okay. So uh, a little bit about my early education, how I got into astronomy. Um, 
This is from actually, uh, I'm going to make myself seem old. This is from 1982. Um, uh, in high school, I was in a gifted and, and talented summer program uh, called CTY. And I took an astronomy class there. Uh, that's the teacher in the back. Uh, and that's me without a beard uh, to his left. Um, and then as a high school senior, I did a project for what was then the Westinghouse Science Talent Search. I believe in more recent years, Intel has taken it over. And so this was sort of my uh, first foray into independent research. And uh, as is typical in, in the things that I, I tend to do well at, I, it was a very simple yet original pattern. Um, it wasn't really uh, very complicated and involved. Uh, 40 of these uh, high school students, including me, uh, you can see me with the beard in the lower right, um, 40 of us got to go to Washington, D.C. Uh, and receive a small scholarship and the top 10 received greater scholarships. Uh, so Dr. Ice, I believe, comes from a background in mathematics. And my project for the Westinghouse uh, Science Talent Search was a, a mathematical project, very simple pattern. I came up with this uh, rectangle of numbers inspired by Pascal's triangle. And you might look at it and think, what's the pattern? Uh, it turns out to be just a very simple pattern I've used to generate this uh, sort of a recursive pattern where you add each number to the number beneath to get the number to the right there. And I wrote a, a short research paper uh, proving by mathematical induction a bunch of interesting symmetries in this shape. Uh, for one, you can see that you get powers of two uh, in two different ways or rather you get powers of two and powers of four. Uh, and it actually also has a very close relationship with Pascal's triangle. If you look at the differences in the columns, uh, those turn out to be Pascal's triangle on its side. So this was a very simple pattern, yet as far as I knew, no one else had come up with this before. So in college, as the intrepid introducers uh, dug up, I majored in both math and physics at Oberlin College, uh, which is in Ohio. Um, uh, Millikan of the famous Millikan oil drop experiments uh, was an undergraduate there. Uh, but my real introduction to astronomy uh, at that time came through an internship in the month of January with Dr. Yo Ah Chu, of the University of Illinois. Uh, she's Taiwanese American. And I think one theme you'll find with my collaborators here is that, you know, even in the time in which I was uh, becoming a researcher, astronomy is a very international uh, group. And uh, we're striving for, to bring in uh, people with all sorts of different backgrounds and gifts. In fact, this summer I am mentoring a student with, uh, with autism. Uh, through NASA's Neurodiversity Network. So Yo Wa Chu, uh, her research was on planetary nebulas, very beautiful gas clouds given off by dying stars. And then for graduate school, I worked with Richard McRae at the University of Colorado. Uh, both of those are now retired. Um, and uh, one interesting fact about Dick McRae is that, uh, well, here he is as a young man with his wife, and who's that over there on his left, or his right? That's Kanye West at age eight. So uh, we used to have this thing called Throwback Thursday, and he posted this picture. Uh, he, this is actually in China. Uh, he traveled a lot to China, and Kanye West's mother was teaching English in China. So that's eight-year-old Kanye West with my uh, thesis advisor. My thesis advisor was an expert on many topics, including especially the supernova from 1987. In 1987, there was a supernova in the nearby galaxy called the Large Magellanic Cloud. And supernovas in our own galaxy happen maybe once or twice a century, but often they're 
obscured by a lot of gas and dust and we don't see them. So it might be hundreds of years before we see a bright supernova in our own galaxy. But uh, my advisor was an expert in studying one of the uh, nearest uh, supernovas in modern times when we had X-ray and ultraviolet telescopes. Okay. So the era in which I started astronomy research is a little different from yours. Uh, when I started around 1990, uh, 1995, um, NASA was just launching uh, what it called its great telescopes, its great observatories, including the Hubble Space Telescope, which is now experiencing some difficulties, the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, and the Chandra X-ray Telescope. Uh, so that was a very exciting time for space-based astronomy because there's a lot of the electromagnetic spectrum that doesn't make it down through the atmosphere. So X-ray astronomy, ultraviolet astronomy, those have to be done with space telescopes. Uh, meanwhile, um, the search for deeper theories of physics was uh, putting all their hope in superstring theory. And it seemed like either they would have all the answers pretty soon, or you could spend your whole career working on that and never really discover anything definite. Now, uh, those of you who uh, will continue in research are coming into a very different time. Uh, I had friends who were working on LIGO, the uh, gravitational wave telescopes that we have now. And they were working for years and years and they had never seen anything. Think about that. If you're an astronomer, you want to be able to say you've seen something with your telescope. But until the year 2015, every gravitational wave astronomer uh, was working to find something, anything, any gravitational waves from the sky, and they had not seen anything. But it's paid off. Now we've been discovering colliding black holes and neutron stars from billions of light years away. Uh, extrasolar planets. When I first became an astronomer, we did not know of planets outside of our own solar system. Uh, we've also directly imaged event horizons around black holes in the past few years. So uh, the field is changing. And uh, perhaps one lesson from the gravitational wave field is that maybe the next new thing hasn't paid off yet. Maybe you can invest in a field that is going to produce a big breakthrough in the future, but has not yet. Okay, so the things that I study with uh, X-ray telescopes and ultraviolet telescopes are known as X-ray binaries. So these are double star systems where one of the two stars is a neutron star or a black hole. Okay, a neutron star is uh, what happens after a supernova and um, the collapsed core of the star compresses the protons together with the electrons and makes just a huge ball of neutrons, maybe just uh, 10 or 20 miles across, but more matter than our sun. So uh, there are two different categories of X-ray binaries. On the left, the HMXB, and on the right, the LMXB. HMXB are the high mass X-ray binaries. And we categorize them based on what kind of normal star we have. Uh, in the HMXB, we have a high mass star that is feeding gas onto a neutron star or a black hole. In a low mass X-ray binary, it's a lower mass star that is feeding gas onto a neutron star or a black hole. Now, there are probably about a billion black holes just floating around in our galaxy right now, but we don't see them, right? Uh, they're named black holes because they don't give off light. So, X-ray binaries are a way for us to study these because of the the uh, black hole or the neutron star because of that object's effect on its companion star. They glow in X-rays because their gravity pulls off gas from the other star 
if that gas swirls around in something called an accretion disk and it can reach temperatures of tens of thousands or in the very center, millions of degrees. So uh, the difference in the behavior of the kind of X-ray binary on the left and on the right is based on how the normal star feeds the neutron star or the black hole. When I say a low mass star, I mean, our own sun would be called a low mass star. Our sun's mass is about two times 10 to the 30 kilograms, right? You write down a two and then 30 zeros. That's how many kilograms of mass are in our sun. But we call that low mass for the purposes of astronomy. So a high mass star might have 10, 20 times the mass of our sun. And a lot of those stars have very strong stellar winds. Now our sun has a solar wind, but these stars being so bright have much stronger stellar winds. Now you might be familiar with comets and their tails. Comets actually have two different kinds of tails, a dust tail and an ion tail. But what pushes out a comet's tail is partly the light of the sun itself. That's what pushes out the dust tail. And a stellar wind is actually gas pushed out by the star's light, just like a comet's tail. So that's a really interesting feature. And um, a very high mass star might puff out into space through its stellar wind. It might puff out about a millionth of the sun's mass every year. So if you have a neutron star or a black hole that is orbiting a high mass star, it can use its gravity to pull in some of that stellar wind. Now, the low mass stars like our sun, they're not pushing out so much with their light. So they don't have really strong stellar winds. The way a neutron star or a black hole in a low mass X-ray binary will pull in its gas is that the uh, low mass star will overflow its area of gravitational influence. And then the gas will swirl around into an accretion disk. Now, let me show you some uh, simulations I've done. Um, this is ongoing work. I was trying to reproduce, okay. There are already some questions here. Uh, Okay, excellent questions. I will address those at the end. Uh, here's a simulation I've done of one of the most famous black hole systems called Cygnus X1. And so this is ongoing research I'm doing. As I've said, I work kind of in between theory and observation. So in order to understand the observations better, I'm doing some uh, computing simulations. On the left, this is color coded showing the density of gas. And on the right, this is color-coded showing the velocity of gas. So this is a computer simulation. Right now it's two-dimensional and I hope to make it three-dimensional. Uh, and this sort of oblong shape you see here is the high mass star. Cygnus X1 is a high mass X-ray binary. So there's the black hole that's over here and there's a very massive star over here. The black hole's gravity has pulled it into a teardrop shape. Now, uh, this massive star has a stellar wind and the black hole is going to mess up that stellar wind with its gravity and by shining X-rays through it. And let's see what happens when we start the simulation. So I put in here the laws of physics, uh, gravity, um, how stellar winds work. And you can see several things going on here that the stellar wind has very low velocities uh, where the X-rays from the black hole can strike it. The wind is expanding much faster on the far side. And you can see that the gas flows are pretty complicated. And you can see it's starting to build up a sort of accretion disk itself. 
So this is one of the tools I use to make sense out of observations that I do computer simulations. Uh, I also wanted to show you some, some very interesting observations about these kinds of star systems. I, I said that there are about a billion black holes just floating around in our galaxy, but we don't see them. We do see these X-ray binaries. And we, we actually have X-ray telescopes that are studying the entire sky all the time. And so there are a few hundred X-ray stars in our galaxy, uh, like Cygnus X1. And they all change their brightness from thousands of times a second to over years and years. So this is a map of our galaxy. This is from, from an olden time X-ray telescope called RXTE. Um, in order to see X-rays, it had to be in space. And it was continuously sweeping around the sky, monitoring every X-ray star to see how it was changing its brightness. So it's, they're like fireflies. This is a firefly season. Uh, these are space fireflies. This one is called Scorpius X1. It's a neutron star. Uh, this is the plane of our galaxy, and you can see that the X-ray stars, this is where our sun is, uh, because of the Earth's orbit around the sun, the line towards the sun, uh, this is the ecliptic path, in other words, is a, a different spot relative to our galaxy center. So you can see that there are a multitude of X-ray stars that are changing their brightness in X-rays over time. And that's another thing that we're trying to understand. Some of these have almost regular cycles and the, the cause of those cycles are unknown. We have theories, but we, we haven't proven anything. Okay, um, back to the slides. So I, I've been talking about black holes and neutron stars. I want to, I, I don't know exactly where everyone's background is. A, a neutron star, uh, one type of neutron star is a pulsar. So just like the earth has a separate north pole of rotation and north magnetic pole, the same can hold true with a neutron star, right? Now, what happens at the north pole of rotation of the earth, right? That is where Santa Claus lives with his elves and Mrs. Claus. But the North Pole of magnetism is where you would get following a compass. And that's not exactly in the straight, the same place. That's somewhere in Canada. And we all know that Santa cannot be Canadian or else he'd say AAA instead of ho, 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 right? Uh, and he'd drive a Zamboni. And instead of milk and cookies, you'd give him uh, protein and emulsion. Uh, but okay, so the magnetic field of a neutron star is going to be where it's brightest at the magnetic poles. Just like the Earth has an aurora around the North Pole. So a uh, pulsar is a little like a lighthouse. It's spinning, but it's also pulsing because its light is coming off of its axis. Okay, so this is from the textbook that I usually use. So a pulsar is a little bit like a, uh, a lighthouse. Okay, so one of my first forays into research uh, with my advisor, Dick McRae, the guy who met Kanye West when he was eight years old, uh, my advisor said to me that there are a lot of these neutron stars that are not pulsars. Why is that? He wanted to write a proposal to use the Hubble Space Telescope to test an idea. Maybe the reason we were not seeing the pulses was that the beam was just missing us. It wasn't, was never pointed towards us. Now, maybe the beam would miss us, but it would hit that accretion disk surrounding the neutron star. Now, this is a diagram from my qualifying research paper for my PhD. Uh, and in the center, there is a white dwarf, but this also applies to neutron stars. And so here's what my PhD advisor said. What if you have 
a pulsar shooting out a beam of X-rays, a special kind of pulsar called an X-ray pulsar. And what if it missed pointing towards us, but it pointed towards the accretion disk? Now, the accretion disk is gas that is swirling around. It's an orbit around the white dwarf or black hole or neutron star. So that means that sometimes the beam of X-rays would light up gas that's coming towards us, and sometimes it would light up gas that's going away from us. So gas coming towards us gets blue shifted, gas going away from us gets red shifted. So we should expect the spectral lines to shift back and forth like a sine wave. Now I said to him, there's just one problem with that, which is that light doesn't have infinite speed. It's going to take some time for that light to reach the disk and then to reach us. And that's going to be a different delay at different times. And in fact, this is a bit of a brain teaser. If you imagine the beam from the pulsar lights up part of the disk, that reflected point can actually move faster than the speed of light because it's not a real thing, right? You know, if, if you need to call Batman, what do you do? This should be an easy question, right? Uh, if you need Batman's help, you take out the bat signal, right? Can the bat signal cross the clouds faster than the speed of light? And the answer is yes, because it's not a real thing. You can't sit down on that uh, light in the cloud and move along with it. So uh, the uh, actual mathematical shape is not a, is not a sine wave. Uh, it's what's known as a cycloid. If you imagine a point on the rim of a wheel and the car is moving along, that makes a shape called a cycloid. It has uh, both a sine wave factor and also a linear factor. And so even if, even if the X-ray beam was completely steady, you would still see a variation in the brightness of the reflection. Because sometimes that reflected point would be coming towards you and its light would bunch up. In fact, this is a slice of a cycloid graph. In fact, you would be able to see more than one point at a time lit up by the reflected beam. Even though there's only one point at a time that's actually lit up, because it takes light time to reach you, you might see four or five points at once. And in the bottom there, the light would, would sort of have a shock wave. So I call these light shocks. When that beam was moving at exactly light speed towards you, its light would get bunched up. So this was an interesting exercise. Uh, again, it's, uh, my personal strengths, I feel, were more in the area of these original kind of simple patterns. Uh, but this was thinking about it in terms of reflecting off a single ring. When you think about the whole disk, the side on the far side gets uh, smeared out. And you, uh, the side on the near side of the disk adds, adds its light waves together. And this is the kind of pattern that you would get. So this was kind of an interesting thought experiment. And we thought, what star system could we use to see if we could actually see this? And we thought of this star system called Hercules X1. Now, uh, it's in the constellation of Hercules, and it was the first discovered X-ray star in that constellation. We thought this would be a good star system to see this effect in because the accretion disk is pretty flat. It's almost tilted at 90 degrees. So we're seeing it like, like pancake, uh, the thin side of the pancake. Uh, so we didn't actually see that effect, but we did find something else that was really interesting. Um, these are ultraviolet spectra. So this was using the Hubble Space Telescope. And I see I already have a question 
about the future of the Hubble Space Telescope. I'll, I'll get to that later. And so a lot of professional astronomy is based on spectral lines. It's a very, uh, very useful technique. Um, I don't know how much background everyone has, but the structure of atoms with their separate energy levels allows for emission and absorption lines because the electrons can only go between certain levels. And so what we're looking at here is uh, four times ionized nitrogen. You know, it's lost for electrons. And so there's nitrogen gas in this swirling disk of gas around this neutron star. And there's kind of a doubling because there are two um, spectral lines right next to each other. But we also see spectral lines from the normal star and from the accretion disk. Now, um, this is a kind of a low mass X-ray binary. The, the normal star is about twice the mass of our sun. So it doesn't have a strong stellar wind. Now, what we were able to learn from these uh, emission lines and they're changing over time was pretty extraordinary. Uh, that phase over there refers to the orbital phase. So this is a binary star system. The neutron star and the normal star are in orbit around a common center of mass. And in fact, the X-rays get eclipsed. As I mentioned, we're seeing it very flat. Not every star system like this has eclipses. But my thesis advisor was, uh, he was very perceptive. He looked at phase point eight over there and he saw something uh, something was wrong because the spectral line on the left should always be brighter than the spectral line on the right. Uh, you can see at phase point eight, there's a narrow, there's, there's sort of uh, four lines, the pair on the left um, and then the pair on the right. And the right line on the pair on the left is too low. The nature of the atomic physics means that that line should always be brighter. So he figured out a way around this, which was that there was not only a stellar wind from the star, there was a stellar wind from the accretion disk. And he, he came up with this idea just based on the uh, noticing that these lines were in the wrong ratio. Now, the way that we see stellar winds uh, through spectral lines is something called a P Cygni profile. There's a star called P Cygni. Um, and it was the star that was first found to display these kind of spectral lines. So uh, one thing that a lot of people starting astronomy aren't aware of is that we very rarely actually see the details of these things. Our spatial resolution is highly limited. We were able to see for the very first time the, uh, the uh, region around the event horizon of a black hole. But most of the time we have to work indirectly. We don't actually see each little piece of a stellar wind. What we see, you know, even the brightest stars are a single pixel to us, except for Betelgeuse, which happens to be very close and big. So um, this uh, a P Cygni line has red shifted emission and blue shifted absorption. And this is the result of the expanding stellar wind. The stellar wind that is coming towards us is the part that blocks the light from the star. The stellar wind that's going away from us can bounce the starlight back to us. So we get extra emission that's red shifted and extra absorption that's blue shifted. And so we went back with a Hubble telescope again to look for evidence for a stellar wind, not from the star, but from the accretion disk. Was the accretion disk not only feeding the neutron star, but puffing out gas in a wind itself? And this is what we saw uh, in a, a, a follow-up observation. You saw the actual absorption there. 
So the reason that the spectral line on the left was too weak was the spectral line on the right was absorbing it. Okay, so that was a fun piece of detective work at the start of my career, but people were very skeptical. Why were they skeptical? I showed you that computer simulation, right, of the Cygnus X1 system. In that system, the X-rays from the black hole wiped out the stellar wind wherever the X-rays could penetrate. So people said, how could you have that nitrogen ion when it's bombarded by X-rays? You'd have to have a huge amount of, of gas flowing out. And that's why I thought there was at first a huge amount of gas. But then I realized the gas was in the shadow of the accretion disk. So uh, let me get back to uh, these highlights of research. Um, after I received my PhD, uh, my first postdoctoral research collaborator was Saku Vertilik. And she's a Bangladeshi American uh, who works as a senior astrophysicist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. As I mentioned, it's a very you know, international field. People from all backgrounds are encouraged. Um, and she's my most common research collaborator. She was very skeptical at first of the stellar wind idea, uh, but we do most of our research together nowadays. Um, here you can see on her webpage, uh, where is her? Okay, yeah, oops. I have to move my Zoom panel, which is getting in the way of my browser here. Okay, so here is her webpage at Harvard. And uh, as you can see, I make, uh, she includes a lot of these 3D figures that we made together. So we are uh, uh, trying to classify the different kinds of neutron stars and black holes using their X-ray colors and variability. And so if you've seen the two-dimensional HR diagram that's used in astronomy, this is sort of a three-dimensional X-ray version that we're making. So she is my most common research collaborator. And while I was at Harvard, I would have dinner with her and her husband every week. And her husband, Jan Vertelich, uh, he is my connection to the summer science program. Uh, every week when we would have dinner at his place, he would speak very highly of his time in the summer science program, uh, tracking the orbits of asteroids. Uh, he's a senior astrophysicist. He works for the Chandra X-ray telescope. He works a lot with the X-rays coming from entire galaxies. Okay. Um, let me skip over this topic as I, it's taking a little more than I thought. Uh, this is another example in my research where I used some uh, simple mathematical symmetries to try to find out about something that was hard to find out about. So this is the LMCX4 uh, X-ray binary system. It's a high mass X-ray binary. So the neutron star here is fed by a stellar wind like Cygnus X1. But this is a neutron star and not a black hole. So in this diagram, NS is the neutron star. And the circle is the normal star the very massive star. And that little eyeball symbol on the bottom is the direction that we are looking from. And so that triangle shape there is showing that the X-rays from the neutron star get blocked by the surface of the normal star. So the stellar wind only exists within that triangle that uh, cannot see the X-rays. So the absorption part of the P-Cygni line seen in ultraviolet comes from that triangle on the bottom. And as the neutron star moves in its orbit, 
that shadow line is also moving. So one of the things we really wanted to know about the stellar wind was how fast is it moving at each distance from the star? Now, people who study stellar winds have all these theories, uh, but we were able to actually measure that. So on the right-hand side there, this is a graph showing the distance from the normal star. One, this is in units of the radius of the normal star. The further from the normal star, the faster the stellar wind is moving. The stellar wind is accelerated by the light of the star, and the longer it's exposed to that light, the faster it's going to move. But the further away it gets, the weaker the force, and so it's going to end up just coasting. So we were able to measure the spectral lines at each phase of the orbit to actually measure how the stellar wind was being sped up. Okay, my most popular research paper, most of my career has been on these neutron stars and black holes, but my most popular research paper was one on gas in elliptical galaxies. And this also relates to a little bit to my contact in the summer science program, Jan Vergelik. Uh, by the way, he's of Czechoslovakian ancestry. So uh, the Vertelik's uh, Saku has a uh, Bangladeshi first name and Czechoslovakian last name. Uh, so um, this uh, graph was the main result of our paper. We were studying uh, the uh, X-rays from entire galaxies. And that was made up of many neutron stars and black holes. And sometimes uh, a white dwarf star system can give off some X-rays. Sometimes just a star with a very active chromosphere can give off a lot of X-rays. So my task was to separate the X-rays coming from stars from the X-rays coming from the gas. And so we found a relation between the temperature of the gas and its luminosity. And this relation hadn't been seen before. And you can see how our measurements had uh, changed the previous measurements. In particular, there's this that kind of pink circle that gets uh, an arrow going up uh, about a hundred times. And it was Jan Vertelich's star student who had observed that before and had found a much lower measurement. But by using a better telescope, we got a more accurate measurement and we were able to show for the first time this relation. Okay, uh, I had a special request that I was told that students were interested in the nicer X-ray telescope on board the International Space Station. And I have done some research using that telescope, but I didn't make that a big part of my talk because we did not really find what we were looking for. Um, so this is another star system that has a massive donor star and either a neutron star or a black hole. It's another X-ray binary. Now, Nobody has definitively proven that it's a neutron star, but we think it is a neutron star and not a black hole. They both give off bright X-rays, so we can sometimes confuse them. If we found pulsations, that would mean we definitely had a neutron star. And just like on my very first project, uh, with those reflected beams appearing to move faster than light speed, this was a star system where we hadn't found pulses. We thought maybe we could find them reflected. Why does this neutron star system not a pulsar? Now, the problem with the data that we got was that the International Space Station uh, has a pretty complicated schedule. They're, they send up supplies, uh, so it couldn't just focus on the star continuously. So this graph here is showing the brightness of X-rays over time. And you can see that our observation was spread out over two months. 
um, and with a lot of gaps in between. And it became a very challenging um, data analysis project to try to find a periodic pulsation when you have a lot of gaps in the data. Uh, this is what the light curve looks like when you fold it over the orbital period. The X-rays are dimmer when the neutron star, we think it's a neutron star, is behind more of the stellar wind. So I, I'll skip some of the details in how hard it was to search for a periodic signal in data with gaps, but this star system is still not known to have pulsations. We still don't have definitive proof that it's a neutron star and not a black hole. So a lot of my career has also been teaching. Uh, you can see on the bottom of this slide, uh, I made an extra credit for one of my astronomy classes to watch live the first press conference about the very first uh, image of the event horizon around a black hole. Uh, so these are my students, all of them showing up for extra credit early in the morning. Uh, so I've taught, as the introduction said, to a lot of colleges and universities. Uh, I tried also to give back to the community. Uh, this was a day when we had a solar telescope on campus, special uh, glasses to watch the solar eclipse. Um, now, I've spent uh, uh, some of my time also, as uh, one of the introducers mentioned, uh, working on some more outside the box ideas. Now, I try not to publicize that too much because these are riskier ideas and they might all turn out to be completely wrong. Uh, so as someone pointed out, I uh, attended the Wolfram uh, Summer School. And for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with what that is or who Stephen Wolfram is, uh, some of those 3D plots I showed you were made using the Mathematica software. It's a software package uh, that does automatic integration, et cetera. It's also a programming language. Uh, and so um, he's a very controversial figure. Uh, he published a book called A New Kind of Science. Uh, he's very interested in a very simple mathematical structure called the cellular automaton. And he thinks it might be the basis of, of physics, for example. Um, and so here I am uh, towards the back right. Uh, and I'm still in contact with the person there uh, to Wolfram's right. Uh, he studied mathematical physics at Harvard. And so um, for those of you who aren't familiar with what a cellular, cellular automaton is, one of the most famous of those is called the game of life. And in fact, uh, right at the start of the pandemic, uh, John Horton Conway, who invented this uh, cellular automaton, he actually died of coronavirus. But uh, what a cellular automaton is, it's a very simple mathematical game, you could say, where each grid space gets updated based on a very simple recursive rule. Uh, and these simple rules give rise here to shapes that move along. And here you can see it's almost like colliding matter and antimatter. These two beams of particles uh, cause each other to disappear. And in fact, these very simple rules can create a computer within its own world. And so in fact, these little dots colliding and disappearing, they can make logic gates. And so this is in fact the game of life simulated within the game of life. Each of these squares is simulating the rules of one of the micro squares. Uh, so there are people who have speculated that this might actually be something similar to this might be the basis of, of physics partly because physics seems to run into problems with very small distances. Uh, this is a, you can see uh, life, it's this computer simulation called life is itself simulating uh, another instance of, of life. So um, 
we know that uh, there's a special distance called the Planck length where our laws of uh, physics break down. So there's been some speculation that uh, maybe space and time have a discrete sort of structure. I see somebody asked already about uh, loop quantum gravity, for example, versus superstrings. Um, and so I've been playing around a little bit with something called the Feynman checkerboard. These are some of Wolfram's uh, cellular automata. Um, and uh, I was also very lucky to meet when I was in Atlanta with uh, David Ritz Finkelstein, who was very much an outside the box science thinker. And in fact, it was he who first proved mathematically that there is no escape from the event horizon of a black hole. And he spent a lot of his career kind of off in his own direction, trying to make sense out of quantum theory, which nobody really makes much sense out of. Um, and trying to go beyond it. Uh, so I sent him a paper that I still haven't published and his first words to me meeting up in the Starbucks are where um, we are in the same field. And so we had two very good conversations. Uh, he died a few years ago uh, at the age of 85. Uh, so, so that's my presentation, uh, 53 minutes in. I think that's about right. Uh, let me see the... Uh, questions shared, and you should also feel free to speak up with questions. Let me see the questions that are here. Okay. Um, can I make this the text larger here? So well, actually, everyone can probably see this on your own screen because you have the link. Do you have more faith in loop quantum gravity or string theory? <laughs> um, now, faith might not be quite the right uh the right uh, mood for a scientist. Um, the question is, you know, are these productive? Um, some people are kind of losing some of the confidence they had in super string theory. Um, there is uh, one professor at Columbia, uh, Peter White, who has a blog called Not Even Wrong. So there was uh, Wolfgang Pauli, very famous physicist. He used to insult other scientists by saying, your theory is not even wrong. Improve it and then it'll be wrong, right? So you want a scientific theory to be something that, that conceivably you could disprove. And uh, unfortunately, um, none of this predictions of superstring theory have been tested yet. Um, uh, now, a lot of the um, Superstring theory is based on this idea of supersymmetry, and there was some hope that the Large Hadron Collider would find some supersymmetric particles, some supersymmetric par uh, partners of the known uh, particles. What supersymmetry means is that for every boson, there is a fermion and vice versa. Uh, particles come in two varieties, whether they can be stacked together into the same quantum state, like light in a laser, that's a boson, or whether they obey the exclusion principle. Electrons cannot share the same orbital with the same spin, they're fermions. And so superstring theory is based on this idea of supersymmetry that for the electron, which is a fermion, there's also a yet undiscovered selectron, they call it, that's a boson. For the photon, which is a boson, there's a photino, which is a fermion but none of that has been discovered yet, nor have the extra dimensions. Uh, so I'm pretty skeptical. Um, you know, there might be a completely different idea that turns out to be right. Um, again, I wouldn't say uh, faith is the proper way to go. Even a wrong theory might provide some very useful ways of thinking. <laughs> so, um, you know, superstring theory, for example, has been used to calculate the uh, what might happen with the entropy of a black hole. So even a wrong theory can help you move towards a correct theory in the future. One very popular development from superstring theory is something called the ADS-CFT correspondence, the anti de sitter space and conformal field theory, also known as holography. That a theory with a uh, higher dimensional uh, interior could also be described 
uh, without gravity on the boundary. So uh, this interrelates two different kinds of theories in a very important way. And this idea grew out of string theory, but it's not limited to string theory. Okay, what are your thoughts on the current failure of the Hubble telescope? Uh, I don't really know the technical answer to that. I see two upvotes there. Um, now, a friend of mine is uh, the deputy director of the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, when I teach classes, I have students interview her. Um, and she's on my Facebook friends page, so I could have asked her. Uh, uh, Rachel Austin, uh, she's the deputy director. I usually have my students do, uh, do interviews with her. Um, so these, uh, the deputy mission head, uh, so the Hubble telescope has had problems in the past and they've been overcome. I don't know whether this one will or not. Uh, we are hoping to launch the James Webb Space Telescope to provide a larger telescope that sees an infrared uh, to look at uh, star birth, to look at galaxies forming at very high redshift in the very early universe. And she's also been involved with that. Um, so if you're really interested, I could send her a message um, and then uh, I could send the group what she says. Okay, let me go back to the questions here. Um, first of all, I'll go to the two up votes here. Do you think we will detect the gravitational wave background anytime soon? Can its detection open a window into new physics? Um, again, this is not my specialty. And again, I have a friend who works on gravitational waves. Um, she, used to, she used to work on x-rays. Uh, we worked on some of the same star systems. Uh, she's a Chinese woman now living in Australia. Um, so uh, she's an expert on gravitational waves. As I said, it's a very international sort of field. Um, and so she used to be an X-ray astronomer and we would kind of mock her like, oh, you're spending your time on gravitational waves. How many things have you seen? Nothing. <laughs> but now she's in the, the, the hot new field. Uh, so um, so uh, I don't really know. Uh, I think, um, you know, we. Uh, we need to see a different frequency range uh, of gravitational waves to see the background. There's talk of a space gravitational wave telescope that's been called LISA that would use uh, a series of satellites to bounce back lasers um, that could see a different realm of uh, frequency of the gravitational waves. Um, there's also a lot of really interesting things that have been happening in cosmology um, with, first of all, uh, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Project and then the, uh, the Planck uh, studying the cosmic microwave background. And uh, there was a hint that they had found, um, you know, some, some signature of, um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to get into the details. There, there were some hints that were later disproven, uh, but there's there's still um, there's certain um, modes that they're still studying with um, the cosmic microwave background. We really don't know where the next big breakthrough will be, uh, and what will will lead to a big discovery. Whether it will be a uh, well, one thing that we usually have confidence is that when we open up a completely new realm, there are usually surprises. Um, with X-ray astronomy or UV astronomy or gravitational wave astronomy, uh, we didn't expect to find black holes uh, 30 times the mass of our sun colliding. That was seemed to be a very high mass. We were kind of surprised that those were so common. Um, so uh, again, I'm not really an expert enough in, um, I, 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 that's something I can look up uh, to see what the frontier of that is right now, the uh, gravitational wave background. Um, so let's see, 
Uh, question four, how was the black hole picture taken? It was taken with radio waves. It was not, uh, we're not seeing anything from within the event horizon. We're seeing the accretion disk around the event horizon. And we used radio waves because those are the best to use the technique of interferometry with. So uh, resolution is a very important word in astronomy. Resolution is what you get tested on when you go to the eye doctor. They say, can you, you, know, can you read the bottom line there? Uh, what is the smallest angle that you can make out? And uh, interferometry combines telescopes that are separated uh, using knowledge of the wave uh, to increase your resolution. And you might be familiar with, for example, the very large array, if you saw the movie Cosmos, um, not the movie Cosmos, the contact, Carl Sagan, that they bring these radio telescopes to different distances apart to try to resolve certain scales. Now, the Event Horizon Telescope combined telescopes around the world to effectively have like a giant humongous telescope that could see down to um, a small fraction of an arc second um, that was able to resolve the secretion disk around the black hole in the M87 galaxy. Um, so it wasn't seen from inside the event horizon, which is impossible. It was seen from just outside it. And what was remarkable was that there was in fact no light coming from what should have been the event horizon. And so uh, the measurement of that, that lack of light region uh, agrees with our measurements of the mass of the, of the center of that galaxy. Okay. Um, why are there tiny temperature variations in the cosmic microwave background? Does it tell us something about the origin of the universe? Okay, great question. It tells us a lot. Um, so the cosmic microwave background radiation uh, was first discovered as just this kind of static by uh, scientists working for the phone company. And they found it was coming from all parts of the sky. Uh, the first telescope to actually notice that it wasn't completely equal around the sky was called COBE, the Cosmic uh, Background Explorer. And so about 10 parts in a million, the temperature of this radiation is slightly different across the sky. And this is our best evidence really for the Big Bang, uh, besides the Hubble law that galaxies further away are going faster. Um, so, um, so the cosmic microwave background, we knew it had to be not exactly equal throughout the sky because we look at the universe now and we see that there are galaxies. There are clusters of galaxies. Um, the galaxies are not completely smooth. And the laws of physics say that in order to get a universe that's clumpy, you had to start out with at least a little clumpiness to start with. Now, gravity will magnify any slight clumpiness. If a little piece of the early universe had a little extra mass, it would pull in more by its gravity. So it didn't have to be vastly unequal, but just like one could say cynically in economic systems that inequality tends to get magnified, that um, the gravity of the universe would magnify those early inhomogeneities. And so the Big Bang could not have left the universe completely smooth. There had to be some very small inequalities that got magnified. Um, now, when I, this radiation doesn't come from the very moment of the Big Bang. Uh, the radiation comes from about um, 300,000 years after the Big Bang, because prior to that, the universe was not transparent, that um, it wasn't cold enough for atoms to form. So all the electrons ran free and the light bounced all around. So you, we can't see any further back in time any more than we can see inside the sun because the sun is thick. What we call the surface of the sun 
is where it becomes thin enough to be transparent. And so um, it tells us a lot about the origin of our universe. Um, there are certain um, numbers that, um, you know, we have, okay, uh, we measured this, uh, the spectrum of, of, of the ripples, like how many of the ripples are around one degree in size? How many are 10 degrees in size? How many are tiny? And that spectrum lets us know uh, what smoothed out the universe in those first 300,000 years and what magnified even earlier inequalities. So how much dark matter is there? How much dark energy is there? In fact, one of the biggest problems in astronomy right now is the expansion rate of the universe, which is measured by the Hubble constant. Now we can measure the expansion rate of the universe by uh, looking at distances to galaxies and their speeds. We use uh, supernovas to measure that. And we get one measurement of the expansion rate of our universe. We get another measurement from the cosmic microwave background radiation and they disagree. So that is one of the biggest problems right now in astronomy. It might turn out to have a trivial technical solution or it might be that our models are wrong. So there's a lot of information there in the cosmic microwave background. Um, you know, uh, dark matter in the early universe tended to, to you know, uh, pull things together and then uh, the radiation would smooth things out. There were oscillations, sound waves that uh, left their imprint on the shape, on the distribution of galaxies. So that's become a very active area of research in the past 20 years. Do you use Navier-Stokes equations to model the movement of gas in the simulation you've shown? Yes. Okay. Um, so a long time ago, I used, uh, you know, there are particular uh, programs that, um, people who do these simulations use. And a long time ago, I used, um, you know, uh, this program I, that, I, I'm, that made that simulation, um, I didn't write that all myself from scratch. I uh, adapted someone else's general purpose program and I put in this condition specific for an X-ray binary. Um, uh, John Blondin at North Carolina State University uh, pioneered these simulations of X-ray binaries. I was at a conference when I heard that a woman from Arizona, a graduate student at the time, had a special uh, program to simulate to solve the Navier-Stokes equations uh, that would use GPU computing to compute it extra fast. Uh, her name is uh, Evan Schneider. Uh, let me see. Uh, um, am I sharing my screen still? Yeah, I am. Good. Okay, so um, she wrote this uh, GPU um, hydrodynamics code for uh, for very fast computing in parallel, uh, and this is what I've been adapting. So um, so she's been using it for her own research. But uh, she makes the program available for others. I think she's now at the Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies. OK. Uh, by the way, the Navier-Stokes equations, they are basically a fluid flow equations that express the laws of conservation of energy and momentum. Uh, there are simpler versions called the Euler equations. Navier-Stokes also involves viscosity, which is something that I don't include in my simulations. Um, okay, uh, what made you interested in X-ray astronomy specifically? So a lot of the things in my, in, in science careers are kind of based on chance. And so it was really who became my thesis advisor. And uh, in fact, x-ray astronomy was just one of the many things that he worked on. 
But um, he was a really great guy. Uh, in addition to meeting Kanye West when he was eight years old, uh, he was a, a big help in my career. And he worked on a lot of things and he was interested in a lot of things. Um, but the project that we worked on was in X-ray astronomy. And um, then uh, when it came to look for a postdoctoral position, uh, I was already working with Saku Vertelik and who works on X-ray astronomy. So that was the natural next step. Um, as a future scientist, how, I, how do I understand if theoretical or experimental science fits me better? What are the main differences in the way of thinking between them and how is the lifestyle different? That's a tough question with a lot of uh, nuance in the answer. Um, now, it might be different, you know, um, in different fields even. Um, theoretical uh, astrophysics often, um, you know, I said that many of my strengths are with finding simple patterns, but often in theoretical astrophysics, the situation can be very complicated. You might uh, deal with, um, you know, thousands of emission lines from different kinds of atoms, different ions causing temperatures to, uh, to rise or fall. Um, so things can be very complicated. Um, and sometimes you're not always looking at uh, an elegant solution, but you have to be careful not to make a single careless mistake. And you have to constantly test to make sure that everything is right. Um, now, one advantage of something at least somewhat close to observation is that if you work on something like loop quantum gravity, um, you know, um, and um, I think my, my friend uh, Lin, Lin Xin Wen, the gravitational wave astronomer, she worked for a while with Lee Smolin, who works on loop quantum gravity. But um, if you work on something like that, you might work with some really interesting ideas but are you ever really going to know that you're on the right path? It might be so far away from anything that we can measure that at the end of your career, you can say, I had some really neat ideas and maybe they someday will turn out to be right, uh, but I don't know. So it's, it's, good, to have, um, it's good to have a little of, of each, I think, um, not only to give you a test, of which do you like more? But I think um, training in observation is also good for a theorist because you know how fallible your imagination can be. Um, you know, uh, you, you're, you're trained to be skeptical that it, here's an idea and it seems so elegant, how could it be wrong? You have to have that experience of finding that even a really elegant idea can be wrong. That is, I think, a good experience for a theorist. How can a white dwarf radiate X-rays? Okay, so gas falls onto either a neutron star or a black hole. It's a little bit like a waterfall, right? Uh, gravitational potential energy is converted to kinetic energy. And then when the water hits the bottom, it makes a sound. And the difference is that it radiates when it it falls down to the neutron star or black hole. Um, there's some friction in the accretion disk. The magnetic field gets tangled up and it gives off x-rays. Now, what about a white dwarf? White dwarfs have less mass. Um, well, uh, they do have less mass than neutron stars or black holes, but they're also larger. So gas can't fall down quite as great a distance. So it's not usually not going to pick up quite as much energy as if it falls onto a neutron star or a black hole, but it can still get heated to X-ray temperatures. In fact, in an X-ray binary, for example, the Hercules X1 system, the neutron star uh, has a strong enough magnetic field that the gas never makes it all the way to the surface um, uh, before radiating the X-rays, the, the accretion disk well, actually, yeah, that's not a that's not a good explanation, I think, um, because eventually the gas does does accrete onto the poles um, through the accretion column. Um, but uh, 
I do have a colleague who works on x-rays uh, from, from white dwarfs, Koji Mukai. Um, he's, he worked and uh, one kind of system of white dwarfs that gives off x-rays is called a cataclysmic variable. And he is an expert on um, white dwarf star systems that give off x-rays or cataclysmic variables. Um, so you can probably simply uh, do the math uh, to see the, um, the energy, uh, you know, GM over R, the potential energy released when you fall onto a uh, white dwarf. And you can see that uh, it would heat up to, um, you know, the rate uh, of mass falling onto the white dwarf would eventually heat up to um, temperatures that give off x-rays. I think about half of the potential energy is released in radiation as it falls down. Okay, um, what does your daily schedule look like? Um, now life's been kind of strange in the pandemic. Um, you know, for about 10 years, I was doing a lot of teaching. I would teach three classes in two labs every semester, but I would also have students uh, who did research with me. Um, and I would guide them in research projects and they would stop by, you know, once or twice a week. Uh, often my collaborators, especially Saku Vertelik, she'll say, oh, I'm working on this project. I need somebody to measure the X-ray spectrum for me. And I'll do that. Um, now, and I also have long-term projects. Um, you know, I left my university, so I had to start up the gas flow simulation again on another computer. And now I'm having to be a bit of a system administrator to get all the software working there. Um, so there's some projects that take a really long time and that's frustrating, uh, but there are also conferences back in the pre-pandemic days. I've gone to conferences in um, Italy, in Prague. Uh, I gave uh, talks on astronomy to a college in India. Um, so, um, you know, Cambridge, Massachusetts, there are often a lot of uh, posters uh, presented there around the Harvard area. Um, so um, so it's, it's different from between scientists and scientists. Um, back in the spring semester, I was teaching remotely to Albion College three hours every day. So that didn't always mean three hour lectures. Sometimes I would have one of my colleagues be interviewed by my students. Um, uh, sometimes I would have them do lab projects. Um, and uh, one, I don't know if, how many of you know about this, but uh, Zooniverse is a very fun uh, website. This is called uh, Citizen Science Site. And you can contribute yourself to uh, making uh, measurements of astronomical data uh, the Galaxy Zoo was the first of these where you can classify galaxy shapes and people have even discovered completely new kinds of galaxies using these websites. So I direct my students towards these for student labs. I tried making one of these myself, but when I moved my university, some of the files got lost. Uh, okay, a star older than 13.8 billion years was found, it is said to be strong evidence for disproving the Big Bang Theory. What are your thoughts on this? My thought is that um, what counts as strong evidence um, and, you know, the phrase it is said is kind of a weasel phrase. I've heard of certain politicians who will say things like people are saying. Um, so, uh, I, you know, who is saying that in particular? Uh, now, there was a time when that was a big problem in astronomy, that there were a lot of stars that were found to apparently be older than the age of the universe as measured by the Hubble constant. Now, there are uh, stars in globular clusters. Globular clusters contain some of the oldest stars in the universe, and there are stars called blue stragglers. Um, that apparently got rejuvenated by the collision between other stars. 
So that is one situation where a star can appear to be a different age than it actually is. Um, so uh, this one example, um, I would more readily guess that there's going to be something very unusual about the history of the star uh, that makes us uh, think that it's older than it is. Um, so um, you know, we have a lot of converging lines of evidence, although also some problems to solve when it comes to the Big Bang. We've got the cosmic microwave background radiation. We've got the distribution of galaxies. We have the uh, Hubble law, the expansion of the galaxies. Uh, we also have primordial nucleosynthesis, the ratio of uh, helium, lithium, uh, beryllium, you know, some of these elements uh, to hydrogen. Um, so um, the Big Bang, um, you know, has when something has so many pieces of interlocking evidence, you're going to need more than just one weirdo star to disprove it. Uh, do you ever study other binary systems such as T-Tauri binary systems? What is the key difference uh, in between their respective accretion disks between both X-ray bi binary mass categories and T-Tauri bin binaries? Okay, so here we're looking at the diff a different stage of star life. We're looking at star birth with T-Tauris. Um, now, um, I have worked on other uh, double star systems. I've worked on star systems called RSCVN star systems that have um, very active chromospheres. They have magnetic fields that get tangled up with each other. And then when they disentangle, they have huge flares. Um, and mostly when I look at the accretion disks in X-ray binaries, I'm thinking of an analogy with accretion disks around the centers of galaxies, which have supermassive black holes. For example, I mentioned that um, the Hercules X1 system might have a, a wind, not from the star, but from the accretion disk. And I have colleagues who are working on the disks around supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies who uh, are also studying winds from those. So I haven't done that much uh, in the sim personally in the similarity. Um, I know that there are a lot of theorists who work on how accretion disks work in general. Um, you know, the balbus holly instability, you know, um, you know, why, why does the gas flow inwards? Um, and I really haven't studied the uh, similarities and differences with the Titari stars. Okay, I think those are the questions there. Does anyone have a, a verbal question? I might have answered those very quickly. <laughs> I can go into more on any topic if you want. Uh, you're muted, Dr. Ice. Oh, I was just simply gonna um, encourage the participants to um, follow up any of those questions with additional um, questions or uh, you know, requests for elaboration or anything else that was in your uh, PowerPoints, please. Oh, we have some hands. Okay. If you want, well, can you see, hold on. I cannot see with you sharing your screen. Oh, okay. So perhaps, okay. here we go. Thank you. Ivan, right. Emily, Watt. Yvonne. Yvonne. Hello, uh, so I have a question. Uh, I've talked to a few uh, theoretical physicists and they told me they move all around the world while doing their research in different universities. Does it work the same way for experimental uh, astrophysicists, let's say, and generally how does like the international community works, like you go around, see things. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, that's, that certainly uh, happens not only among theorists. Um, so uh, there's a, a woman who got her PhD from MIT who works on very similar star systems that, that I do on high mass X-ray binaries. And she was working at the University of Tübingen in Germany, but she's moving now to the Netherlands. 
Uh, I'm following her on Twitter and she's, you know, filling it up with tweets about, uh, let me see if I can find her. Yeah, here she is. Um, let me share my screen again. Uh, where's, uh, there's Zoom. Uh, let's see, share screen. Okay, so uh, Dr. Victoria Grinberg, uh, she got her PhD at MIT. Uh, she was junior research group leader at the University of Tübingen in Germany. Um, and um, now she's working for the science division of the European Space Agency in the Netherlands. And as you can see in this picture, she works on very similar star systems that I do. Um, maybe more similar than anyone else. She works on high mass X-ray binaries in particular. So let me get back to Zoom here and stop my screen sharing. And um, Emily, why? Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so I know you mentioned this um, when you're talking about uh, Conrad's Game of Life. What it, could you elaborate on the stuff that you did with that? Okay, uh, so Conway's Game of Life is something that a lot of uh, amateurs have uh, explored, explored a lot. Now, I haven't really um, used that in particular. There's a whole kind of Wikipedia um, site where people explore new patterns in the Game of Life. They build new kinds of spaceships and. They say, can you move at this speed? You know, every um, every 30 cycles, can you move 17 squares? Have you created a shape that moves like that? Uh, so there are people who work specifically on that. Um, but um, let me talk a little more about what I was working on in terms of, um, you know, again, this is very kind of outside the box um, ideas. Um, but uh, there's something called the Feynman checkerboard. Um, now, in uh, quantum mechanics, you've probably heard of the Schrodinger equation, which is the basic equation describing how probability amplitudes spread out through space and time. But a more basic equation is called the Dirac equation, uh, which involves not just quantum mechanics, but special relativity. And so the Feynman checkerboard is, uh, was created by Richard Feynman. And it's a very simple a lattice sort of structure where um, uh, it's basically just a one dimensional uh, example of the Dirac equation of relativistic quantum mechanics. And uh, this is just from the Wikipedia entry. And um, what happens in the Dirac equation is that you combine relativity and quantum mechanics and you find that uh, electrons have to have spin. They have to have spin and they have to have something called helicity. Uh, there's one point of view of electrons in which they travel at the speed of light and then they get bounced and travel at the speed of light in the opposite direction. Uh, that's also sometimes called Zitterbewegung. I'm probably uh, making a mess of that German word. But there's a point of view in which the electron bounces back and forth at the speed of light. And if you limit yourself to one dimension, you can make a very simple model by having, um, by imagining the electron can move right or left. And there's always some very small chance that it will change direction. And when it does, the quantum amplitude gets multiplied by an imaginary factor. So this solves the one dimensional uh, Dirac equation. It's a very simple lattice. Um, and it's been tricky to try to extend this to three dimensions. Um, now, one thing I tried to bring into this was that, um, you know, I, I thought about it, it, you know, what could I do that hadn't been done before? And, you know, all the, super smart people who invented quantum mechanics, none of them thought that parity would be violated. So parity is when you look at physics in a mirror, um, 
you exchange left and right-handed particles. Using the right-hand rule, for example, uh, a particle with a spin in the, uh, that would have angular momentum like this, uh, you know, would be moving in this direction. That's um, a right-handed helicity particle. And uh, this would be a left-handed helicity particle, but they don't behave the same in a mirror. And so I thought, well, maybe has anybody ever come up with a very simple model that has structures that move left and right that are different? And so that's what I, I started out with, a very simple one-dimensional model where one pixel moved to the right, two pixels moved to the left, and I tried to get a version of the Dirac equation, which also uh, would treat the particles moving in different directions in a different way. Uh, later, I've been uh, looking more at uh, the material graphene, which is also a, a very uh, simple lattice. And what's amazing about this material is that it also obeys the Dirac equation. Now, the Dirac equation is a relativistic equation which you need, usually need to have things moving at light speed to explain. But somehow just dealing with nearest neighbor interactions like the game of life, where each cell only depends on its neighbors, on a hexagonal lattice, graphene is like a single layer of graphite. And like a diamond, it has a hexagonal structure. So this also obeys the Dirac equation, the basic equation of relativistic quantum mechanics, somehow through nearest neighbor interactions, even though there's nothing relativistically happening. So I've been playing around with um, trying to make sense of it out of the Dirac equation, out of parity violation, and out of simple either one-dimensional or hexagonal lattices. So I think that might answer your question. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Okay. Okay, other questions? I think you're muted. Yeah, I do that all the time. Um, is there any clarifications or um, follow up you wanted to hear about a little bit more on anything that he was talking about? Okay, so uh, a couple of things I can follow up with you. Um, uh, I think, let me let Jody ask what she was going to say. I'm sorry. Okay, I didn't see. Yeah, <laughs> That's quick, okay. I was just wondering, um, do you think if you hadn't done your work with mathematics and patterns in your early career, then your work in Astro would have changed significantly? If I, if I hadn't worked on those? Would it, okay. Well, some people who become mathematicians, um, they really believe that math is real. They're mathematical Platonists, but I, I never accepted that. Uh, so I wanted to go into astronomy. Uh, what if I had gone into astronomy without that background? Um, now, um, I don't know exactly how it would have been different, but um, I think that that sort of gave me a sort of niche where I um, I skipped over even some of the, of the other things where a lot of the work I do is um, trying to go from what we see to the geometry of these gas flows. But um, there's a lot in, ast in astrophysics which, um, which isn't so specifically about mathematical patterns. Um, and um, in fact, um, I, I emphasize the things that might make me a little more unusual in the field. Um, and, um, you know, oftentimes there's a situation where there are a lot of things happening. One of my other teachers, uh, Tim Kalman, uh, he also studied with the same uh, PhD advisor. One of his big contributions to the field is writing a program that calculates what happens when you shine x-rays on gas. And you have to, he had to be really detailed and he, he's hired generations of students to uh, you know, all these different kinds of atoms in different situations. So I have an appreciation for getting above the details. Um, when you get down to the details, um, you have to do a lot of checking. 
um, unless you're naturally very, um, you know, observant of every single thing going on. Uh, so there's a lot of room for, for mistakes when you have a lot of things going on. In fact, um, so he wrote a program called XSTAR. He had a rival who wrote a program called Cloudy. And sometimes they would meet up and compare output. So you have to do a lot of checking. Um, you know, whether you're on the side of, uh, you know, building instruments or building models, um, that you have to do a lot of checking what you do. And thinking of, you know, this idea like the reflection of a X-ray beam moving faster than light, that was easy for me to get started with because I didn't have to worry about so many details. It was just an idea. Um, and sometimes you can make a big discovery when you make a prediction that, you know, is pretty unambiguous. When we look at this star, um, you know, it will uh, eclipse, you know, in a, in a way that's never been seen before, um, the star system. But sometimes you have to work out very patiently and, and test with a lot of details. Um, so the use of math in general in astronomy, I think I came from a background where I enjoyed math and I was a strong math background. Maybe also a shout out to my high school math teacher, Dan Flagler, um, who you know helped me with that Westinghouse project. Um, so um, you know it certainly um, you know helps you know in understanding the concepts. You know uh, you might not be doing integrals all the time, but um, to understand that you know. You're, when you talk about how bright the X-rays are between this energy and that energy, you're performing an integration. You know um, that. Um, you know uh, I do also a lot of work with time series analysis, how things are changing over time, whether it's a pulsation, or I showed you like those X-ray stars flickering like fireflies. Uh, so there I do a lot of. Um, Fourier analysis, a power spectral analysis, you know, the same kind of analysis that we do to the waveforms of sound waves to understand why a piano sounds different from a violin. Um, so things changing over time, that's also a very mathematical uh, approach. And I had an in with that. Um, so uh, definitely math um, in general is a tool that people use. Uh, pure math, kind of elegant thinking, um, that's kind of, you know, it's a niche where you can apply it. Um, and, and, you know, in astronomy, we're interested usually not in the, how neat the idea itself is, but whether it advances the, the knowledge of the field. Do you have any, you know, what is, what is your personal interest in the question? Oh, I was just kind of curious. Okay. Okay, I see a hand raised from Jack. Yeah, kind of following up on that, I was curious, like when you're creating like a new mathematical model or some something like that, how do you, like, when do you know like enough checking is enough or like when are you confident enough to like sort of publish it and put it in a paper? Um, let's see. Well, I have, I, I'm not really sure um, exactly which stage of the work that I've done that you're addressing. I actually haven't published anything on my more outside the box physics ideas, although I have gone to conferences where I've presented posters. So there are areas within um, the lifetime of a scientific idea where you can kind of be more tentative. Uh, conferences, a conference poster, um, is a place where you could present an idea that um, you're just kind of testing out. Um, now, when it comes to, um, you know, the life of an idea which is tied into like uh, an observation of a star system like this, um, where I used the, the shadow of the X-rays to kind of get, understand different slices of a stellar wind, that idea, for example, I came up with that and then I presented it to my uh, thesis advisor uh, after I had already gotten my thesis done, after I already got my PhD, and he was really excited. In fact, he came up with 
an, an, another elegant idea that I used in the same paper, just immediately right after seeing my IDs, he, you know, he had some criticisms and I was able to answer those criticisms. He said, well, actually, you're only seeing the speed of the gas towards you. And there's some of the, you know, with the Doppler shift, it's also moving to the side. And I said, well, actually, you know, I can calculate that uh, it's still the fastest, you know, I can calculate that angle and I can compensate for that. Um, so uh, he was excited about the idea and then he wanted to come up with his own idea. And right then and there, he said, well, you know, the regions of constant uh, velocity are like, um, they're like um, conic section, they're like um, conic sections and um, you're, so you're slicing a cone with a certain uh, angle. And so I expect, you know, I, I don't remember all the details, but right then and there, he came up with his own add-on to the idea. And I presented it at conferences too. Um, so it, it also has to make its way past a referee. Um, so if you're going, going to have a referee publication, um, at a certain point, it's no longer your responsibility to be self-critical. You're, you've, you've subjected it to self-criticism and now it's the time for the community to be critical. And that starts with the referee. Uh, you know, if you become a scientist, you'll be a referee too. Um, and you'll, you know, uh, it's usually an anonymous procedure. Um, and usually they'll, they'll find some things that they'll, they'll like in your paper and other things that they'll criticize and say, well, have you thought of this? Um, you know, and there are, you know, personal rivalries. I, I shared an office at NASA with a very colorful Russian astrophysicist uh, who would always have these personal rivalries with other astrophysicists and people will call each other's ideas garbage. You know, most people are very friendly, but some people are, you know, kind of um, enjoy that kind of rivalry. Um, there's a famous story of him looking at somebody else's poster at a conference, and it was a very pretty poster with a lot of different colors. And he said, that is crap of many colors. So, <laughs> um, so uh, criticism is healthy. Um, you know, science makes mistakes. And sometimes uh, there's this um, guy at the Space Telescope Institute, uh, Mario Livio, uh, works on planetary nebulas, and he's he has a book called Brilliant Blunders. So sometimes a mistake can be very productive too. Um, so it's important to try a lot of things and um, to test in a lot of different ways. Um, when I first started working for Saku Vertilic, she had a program to calculate the uh, continuous light of X-ray binaries, and I had to update it, and it was all written in Fortran. That's, that's how old we, we are, right? Uh, <laughs> kids these days, <laughs> we had to, you know, walk uphill both ways and we programmed in Fortran and we liked it. Uh, <laughs> you've probably never seen that Monty Python sketch. Okay, but uh, um, so we programmed in Fortran and, you know, other people had similar versions of this program. So I tested the output of our program against their published versions so you try to reproduce what's already known with your models and that gives you confidence that it's right. And, but as I said, at some point, it's the responsibility of the community um, because you're not the only scientist in the world and there's someone else who's going to read your paper and move beyond it, hopefully. You know, that's the goal of a successful paper, not to be, to be there and never read and never used. Thanks so much. Okay, Aaron. I know this might seem like a pretty basic question, but most of us want to be scientists ourselves one day. And I would just love to know what for you personally is the most fulfilling and exciting parts of your career as a scientist and what just keeps you going. Oh, that's, that's a, um, you know, I think it's more that science keeps me going. <laughs> um, I mean, there's always hope for discovering more things. Um, you know, um, you know, I'm tied into the community and if I don't discover something, then at least, um, you know, maybe one of my friends will and, you know, I'll teach it to my class. Um, and, you know, there, uh, 
you know, there are small things that you can make progress on day to day uh, and definite things. And so there's a really like a whole spectrum. Um, you know, you can wonder about, you know, what is matter really made of? And you can learn about the frontier there. But at the same time, you know, you, I've got a column of numbers in front of me and, you know, there are these websites that list these hundreds of stars and how they're changing every day. Um, and so the, the star I did my thesis on, Hercules X1, it sometimes turns off for, for years on end. The X-rays turn off and nobody knows why. And so, you know, it's something you can go back to and, um, you know, you can be interested in the idiosyncrasies of the specific, or you can be in search for some kind of grand general explanation. So it's, um, it really informs, you know, how you view the whole world to see it scientifically and, um, you know, to share it with students and to see their progress and colleagues. Um, yeah, it's, um, you know, uh, it's been weird in the pandemic being so separated from colleagues. Um, Saku and Jan Verdelik did, um, did personally uh, drive through town uh, about a month ago. Uh, we saw, we went to some sculptures um, <coughs> and I hope to go back to uh, the Harvard area soon. Um, so it's been weird, but, um, you know, I keep, um, I keep programming away at my, my models and I keep, you know, every day thinking about, you know, how is it possible that, you know, the left-handed and the right-handed electrons are different and things like that. Okay. Um, Ivan, you also have another question? Yeah, I do. Uh, so uh, it's kind of related to the question I asked about the difference between theoretical and experimental uh, sciences. So um, in, in such a like young age, when we're like preparing to enter the field of science, properly is there any hints you can see in yourself which will like point towards where would you feel more maybe productive either in the theoretical or experimental science uh, i think a lot of how the arc of a person's scientific career works out is often kind of chance and it's more like um a local minimum versus or local maximum versus a global maximum you know um you know, that describe, you know, if you have a uh, function, you know, and you're trying to find the maximum, you say, oh, well, the derivative is equal to zero, right? But that will only be the local maximum. And that's often actually a lot of what I'm doing with model solving. I'm trying to find a model that fits the data and maybe I'll find a local maximum. Um, but that's also what happens with a career a lot too. You know, I get an opening I had an internship with Yo Wa Chu at the University of Illinois, and she happened to work a lot with Dick McRae. And so she said, go work with him. And so uh, I brought my particular uh, strengths and weaknesses to, to him, you know, um, and he, he guided me in a certain way. And I could have ended up, you know, working with him, I could have ended up working on um, the interstellar gas, I could have worked on uh, supernovas, but I ended up working with uh, X-rays. High energy astronomy sounds cooler than planetary nebulas, it's because it's you know, you know, neutron stars and black holes. Um, uh, and I think also you know I, I I've always loved music and the time series analysis, things changing over time. Um, that also uh, appealed to me. Um, so I think, uh, you know, you can try to find a better global maximum if you try a lot of things, but I think um, you're always going to be, you know, a little limited given how much possibility is out there. And, you know, if you, you know, went into, uh, you know, some people might not have such good luck with their advisor and might have to switch advisors. Um, when I was at NASA, uh, the guy down the hall, who's now a professor, he his advisor was, you know, uh, worked him really hard. His father, my, my friend's father had died and he, um, he went to the funeral. And while he was at the funeral, his uh, supervisor, supervisor kept, you know, trying to reach him to get more results from him. Um, so, um, 
was it be you know if he had problems then was it because of the field he was in or was it the personality conflict with his advisor um so um pe people are going to bounce around in life um and there's going to be an element of chance in where you end up um you know people who spent years and years on on gravitational waves you know they 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 got became lucky if they stayed in the field but someone might have said i've had it you know in 2014 they might have said i've had it we haven't seen anything i'm leaving and then the next year they have found colliding black holes you know so some of it is up to nature you know so i'll try to get back to you on the uh the status of the hubble telescope um uh, with my my contact, who's the deputy director. Okay. That would be great. All right, we just have a couple more minutes. Anything else that you can think of to ask or ask for clarification or elaboration? Okay, another from Havan. Yeah, I just, I think like, uh, so you said that uh, the field of astrophysics is an uh, international and like open field. So, and you also said like you worked uh, in NASA. So is there many um, research opportunities in the United States for the uh, international uh, students? Yes, uh, particularly in the time when I was um, starting research, um, I was almost vastly outnumbered by international students. Uh, a good test of it is if someone says the word football, uh, what do they think of? And I was probably the only one in my hallway at Harvard for whom football did not mean soccer. Okay. Um, you know, I, the last time I was at Harvard, I shared an office with an Italian guy. There were uh, Polish women. There were quite a few Italian people, an Israeli guy. Um, so I think maybe a lot of Americans who are good with uh, numbers and good with math, they go into computers or into finance to make a lot of money. Um, I'm not sure why it was, but it was extremely international. And, and um, sometimes I would go to parties and just, um, you know, at, you know, mixers at the Center for Astrophysics. And I was just, I just wanted to see another American and I would, my ears would perk up when anyone <laughs> spoke with an American accent. So, <laughs> uh, so it's very common. So if football means soccer for you, uh, you're probably at home. <laughs> uh, you've also got the advantage that you uh, use metric units uh, naturally. Although I do have to warn you guys that um, astronomers use what's called CGS. Uh, all, all other physicists use MKS. Uh, the default for distance for astronomers is centimeters, whereas for other physicists, they use meters and kilometers. You might think that's really stupid to measure distance in centimeters when you, you're like measuring across the universe. Why would you measure the sun's mass in grams and not kilograms? And the answer is that it doesn't make a difference because you have to use scientific notation anyway. And it's just the cultural idiosyncrasy of astronomers that we use CGS. Uh, so that's, you know, uh, you'll feel right at home uh, uh, at, at a research institute, um, you know, uh, it's very international collaboration. All right, so with that, I think that we are out of time for today. So put your hands together and thank Dr. Borison for his time and his interesting talk. We appreciate it so much. Um, clearly my favorite quote of the day is simply do the math. I mean, I don't know what else to say. Um, however, um, crap of many colors is, is creepy <laughs> favorite list. Uh, you know, that, that's pretty darn good. I have to agree. So anyway, so we appreciate you. We thank you so much for your time and expertise. I'm sure the participants got a lot out of your talk and your the uh, willingness to answer all their questions. And with that, I'm going to stop our live on YouTube and tell the participants that they are dismissed until their work play block. So 